Hello, it's great to see all of you here. Welcome to the Library of Congress National Book Festival. It's so great to see so many people today, like really happy to see a lot of people here at this, sta uh, at this venue, and especially here at the Insight stage. Uh, welcome also to our C-SPAN viewers and to the, everyone watching us online uh, in DC, in the country, and around the world. Uh, we're proud to, uh, El Tiempo Latino is proud to partner with the National Book Festival. I am Rafael Ulloa, Executive Vice President of Content for El Tiempo Latino, um, Spanish newspaper here in DC and a national publication as well. Uh, El Tiempo Latino is always committed to foster the uh, love of, of books for our community. Los Latinos leemos and El Tiempo Latino is bringing all, uh, all the community together for uh, getting together around the love for books and literature. Um, on behalf of the Library of Congress, I want to ask you, if you see a survey taker roaming around the festival, please stop by and talk with them, take the survey. The Library of Congress is very interested in hearing from you, and all your suggestions and recommendations uh, are important, and the library is uh, looking forward to, to incorporate some of them for future national book festivals. The next event on this stage is titled Myths and Promise. Decoding Latino in America. We are very happy to feature today Hector Tobar, Jose Olivares, and Yasmin Ulloa at this panel. Hector Tobar is a Pulitzer, a prize-winning journalist and novelist, and he's also a contributing writer for the New York Times opinion pages. He's the son of Guatemalan immigrants. He's a native of LA, Los Angeles. His new book, yeah, LA people in the house, right. His new book is Our Migrant Souls. Jose Olivares is a child of Mexican immigrants. He grew up in the Chicago area and currently lives in New York. His, about, his debut book of poems, Citizen Illegal, won the 2018 Chicago Review of Books Award for Poetry. His latest book is Promises of Gold, Promesas de Oro. And our moderator is Yasmin Ulloa, a national politics reporter for the New York Times, roving the country in search of congressional races, districts, and people that capture the political forces reshaping American politics. Before she came, the, uh, she came to the Times, she covered Congress at the 2020 presidential and the 2020 presidential campaign for the Boston Globe from Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's really, ha really great to have you here, and we are ready for a great conversation, and welcome to our guests. We thought it'd be good to start with a bit of a scene setter, and we're going to have a little bit of a reading. I'm going to have Hector read a, a, a passage from his book, the opening passages to his book. Um, well, first of all, thank you to the um, Library of Congress uh, for having us. What a wonderful honor for this son of Guatemalan immigrants to be here in the nation's capital before you. Thank you. You write words for me to read a string of memories that place me inside the eyes of the child you were. A daughter of Honduras, of Mexico, and of Puerto Rico, and of the Central Valley of California with its flat, dry plains covered with crops and cows and towns filled with paisas and their chickens. <laughs> you sit in my office and begin to weep as you tell me the story of your undocumented boyfriend and the demons that haunt him and it is clear to me that you should break up with him, even though I cannot say this. You tell me about your best friend, a white girl, and about the African-American family who lived next door. In your stories, I see a suburb of rectangular lawns and a rancho in the rural United States where the neighbors heard your mother and father yelling at each other and where you took solace in the natural beauty of your surroundings. In the crisp desert wind, and the muddy yellow outline of mountain ranges. You write, I am having a nervous breakdown, but your prose belies this. Controlled and precise, it tells a story of violation and survival you endured when you were a kindergartner. Mm -hmm. I read the pages you write for me, and I learn that as a child, you were the good daughter who helped raise her siblings. You were the son who worked alongside your father in his landscaping business. You were the daughter who rubbed your father's weary feet every night. 
and you recount the months you were living in your car with your parents and brother, taking baths at night at the spigot outside a laundromat. You describe the water flowing over your butt cheeks in a way I'll never forget. When your parents were depressed and nearly broken, you kept the home together. You witnessed your mother disappear to confront your father's lover, and you watched the home invaders who arrived in your living room, criminals speaking bad Spanish with their children in tow. You cooked and you drove siblings to doctor's appointments, and now I see you sitting before me, your sense of humor intact, an awareness and a dignity and a purpose about you. In a minute, you will become frazzled, but 15 minutes later, you will recover yourself. Your eyes dart nervously, and then suddenly, I see the centered you, and I want to weep because I can see you walking into the future unbroken. Thank you. That's beautiful. I, it, it's, it's really amazing how in just those two paragraphs you, you managed to capture just this, the wide breadth and scope of nuestra gente, of la comunidad latina, in geography, in citizenship, in, in um, our pain, but also our joy. I wanted, to, if you could speak a little bit to how you came to that opening and why you decided to open it that way, your book that way. Yeah, the, the, the real big inspiration uh, for our migrant souls um, are, are really two African-American writers, W.B. Du Bois, um, who, who wrote um, uh, Souls of Black Folk, and James Baldwin. And I had read James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time um, just before the pandemic. And I thought I really would love to write something like that about being Latino because so many of my students have that same kind of anger that James Baldwin felt in 1963, you know, that anger uh, living in a country that devalued his people, that insulted his people. And I wanted to write something as passionate as James Baldwin wrote in The Fire Next Time. And of course, James Baldwin writes this essay. The beginning is addressed to his nephew, his young nephew. And I thought, you know, I, I want to write to my students because I, I teach these classes at the University of California, Irvine, where my students tell stories about growing up Latino in a society filled with so much hatred and xenophobia. And they talk about the pride that they have in their families, the hurt that they feel. Um, and I just wanted to speak to that, to speak to their voices. And so um, after, you know, I, I was lucky to get a fellowship to go to Harvard for a year to, to write my book, I had in my, my head the voices of my students in all of these incredible essays they wrote to me. And I just let it all pour out. Yeah, so. and I, I was wondering whether there was a specific moment or whether this was something that you'd been talking about, you know, thinking about for, for a, a couple of years. You know, right now there's such a debate um, about Latinos, who we are as Latinos, what we should call ourselves as Latinos, whether it should be Hispanics or Latinx, whether those labels are just way too broad mm -hmm. to, to describe our community, whether it raises Afro-Latinos. Um, and so in, in politics, you know, the big question for us is where, what, what will the, the, the political future of, of Latinos look like? But it feels like in journalism and, and in politics that that conversation really started taking place really in the last four years and really after the murder of George Floyd. Right. Wondering whether there was a specific moment for you that, that kind of sparked this exploration of what it means to be Latino or, or whether it was something that you've just kind of been thinking about. Well, I think the, the George Floyd spring, you know, we were all in this moment of reflection. We were all locked inside of our houses and we see a man being tortured to death. Then we, there's a, a kind of mini rebellion across the country. In Los Angeles, there were some incidents, you know. So, um, and, and it sparked this national conversation about race. And it was really important. I mean, people who had never really thought about race were putting up Black Lives Matter signs. I personally thought that was fantastic, but I also missed us being part of that conversation. You know, because I think that if you think about the central idea that defines American politics today, it's the threat of Latino immigration. And it's the racialization of Latino people. The fact that we have been made out to be this barbarous mass of uneducated people who are threatening to bring down the republic. There's a whole television network dedicated specifically to that. 
And so for me, I felt, why aren't we having a national conversation about the racialization of Latino immigrants and Latino identity? And so that's why I wrote my book. Got it. Well, I, I, I loved your book. There were so many great lines in it. And, and actually, uh, you, you write, you know, my favorite chapter was actually intimacies because you write about the influence of, of Latinos on, on white America. But I, I really love the way you, you, you write, the drama of white Latino contact is not yet a part of the United States image of itself. And then you go on to describe all these intimate ways in which Latinos influence white families, white people, white society, the, the Mexification or the Latinofi Latinofication of the United States in day-to-day in -day life in these really intimate moments. Um, and then and what I really like about that is that you write about, uh, Lat you know, usually we write about Latinos as we relate to white people, but you like inverse that and you really center Latinos. Is, is that an accurate characterization? And can Absolutely. you speak more to, to how, you, how you decided to do that? Yeah, you know, once again, I think Du Bois and Baldwin were really, really important to me um, because Du Bois talks about how African-American people at the height of Jim Crow had a second sight. You know, it gives you being excluded so viciously from American society gave African-American people this understanding of deep truths of the United States that white people couldn't see. And so to me, and, and Baldwin says the same thing uh, over and over again, Baldwin is very much concerned with deconstructing whiteness. And so to me, part of my privilege as a son of immigrants, as a Latino person, as a brown person of color, is that I can think about the, 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 the history that constructed these ideas, right? The history that's constructed these ideas of who my people are and how we fit into the United States. And so to me, a lot of this book is not just about deconstructing what Latino means, it's also about deconstructing what white means. And, and to me, I, I arrived at the realization through a lot of reading, you know, I was reading a lot of, there's a lot of uh, work now being done about the construction of white identity. And so to me, whiteness is this state of painlessness where you've erased the pain of history, right? unless you're Jewish, of course, in which you embrace that history, right? Uh, but whiteness as a state of mind means that you've erased the pain of the Irish famine. It means you've erased the, the humiliations of Italian immigration or whatever, right? And so to me, that, that's, that's, and that's what we're supposed to have become as Latino people. You know, we were supposed to merge into, assimilate into that painlessness, and it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened because of the border, and it hasn't happened because of the way the border is used in American political life. Um, so to me, those are all, it's just really been fascinating to explore um, how these race ideas are constructed, because really we have so much more in common um, than we really know. Yeah, and we're, we'll, we'll get a little bit more into that. Yeah. Uh, but when I want to ask both of you some, some of those questions. You, you touched on, on some of the issues that I want to follow up on. But um, the other thing that throughout the book, you write uh, about the need for a protest movement, right? To recognize our, the hard work of Latinos, the value, the contributions that we bring to this country. Um, you write, Hollywood will continue to make us into villains and non-entities until there is a seismic shift in the social and cultural perspectives in American society akin to the one black people brought forth in the decades after the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. When that, and you say when that day comes, Latinx people will get in the face of the country's cultural barons inside their boardrooms and their living rooms. And, and um, I, I'm just really curious about that work choice. You don't say if, you say when. It's almost as if it's a surety, like it's a sure thing that that there's going to be this, this protest movement, that it's coming, that it's building. Do you see it as a sure thing, or how do you see it, and, and, and why? I, I see it as a sure thing because we love ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have self-love as a people. And I don't believe that we're going to tolerate our erasure from American public life much longer, because we are erased. Now, you were speaking before about my chapter, Intimacies. My chapter, Intimacies, is about the way Latino life is just melded into the life of the United States in all of these ways, including in mixed, all these mixed families. Almost every Latino person I know has white relatives, and almost every white person I know is married or works with Latino people in some way. But that's just not part of our image of ourselves. 
There isn't a 20 part next Netflix series about a Latino, a black and a white family and the way they all sort of like live together in a town that because they don't see us as serious people. They see us as extras, you know, and it just just drives me crazy every day. It's what gets me up at 530 in the morning to write because I don't want to be an extra. Mm -hmm. My people are not extras. And I, feel, I can feel this in so many ways among the generation of students that I teach. And I believe that they're gonna find thousands of ways to knock down those barriers and to, to put us front and center in the American story, which is where we belong. So when did you first hear the word Latino? And, and what was the context and how did it make you feel? Well, I mean, to me, uh, Latino is a word I first heard in the 1980s. You know, I grew up in LA in the 1970s. I was always thought of myself as Guatemalan, Guatemalan American. Latino uh, is a term that I started to hear in college and then I got a job at the LA Times in the 1980s. And the LA Times adopted Latino as the house style. It was one of the first media agencies in the United States to do that. So, and also that came at the same time that I started having all these relationships with people who were not Guatemalan. My best friends in college, the guys who got me high for the first time, the guys who got me drunk, you know, at the party, they were all Chicanos, they were Mexican Americans. I knew it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> knew it. And, and the people who turned me on politically, you know, and eventually I married into a Mexican American family. A family that has its roots in El Paso, by the way. Oh, nice. You know, in El Paso, Juarez. My mother-in-law is from Juarez. <laughs> and so, and that, so to me, Latino is an expression of an alliance. The fact that, you know, somebody from Chicago and somebody from Juarez, El Paso, and somebody from LA and whose family's from Guatemala, we can all be in the same panel together because we have this commonality of our experience and the commonality isn't necessarily the Spanish lurking in the back of our brains because most of us have forgotten it. It's, it's the fact that we have this story of a journey in our background and that Latino is an expression of that and it's, of course, it's been commodified, it's been taken over by the, you know, by the media, and it's turned into a television commercial or whatever, but it's also an expression of a genuine shared experience. And to me, that's from the 1990s onwards, when all the Puerto Ricans and the Colombians and the Ecuadorians and the, you know, and the Mexicans all started getting together, that's where Latino comes from. Got it, perfect, perfect. Um, well, now I wanted to have uh, Jose read some of his poetry. Um, he, he picked out a, a chapter as well. We're gonna continue the... Latino discussion, mm -hmm. but together. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everyone? My name is Jose Guadalupe Olivares. This poem is called Mexican American Disambiguation. My parents are Mexican who are not to be confused with Mexican Americans or Chicanos. I am a Chicano from Chicago, which means I'm a Mexican American with a fancy college degree and a few tattoos. My parents are Mexican, who are not to be confused with Mexicans still living in Mexico. Those Mexicans call themselves Mexicanos. White folks at parties call them pobrecitos. <laughs> American colleges call them international students and diverse. My mom was white in Mexico, and my dad was mestizo, and after they crossed the border, they became diverse and minorities and ethnic and exotic, but my parents call themselves Mexicanos, who again should not be confused for Mexicanos living in Mexico. Those Mexicanos might call my family gringos, <laughs> which is the word my family calls white folks. And white folks call my parents interracial. Colleges say, put them on a brochure. <laughs> my parents say, que significa esa palabra? I point out that all the men in my family marry lighter-skinned women. That's the Chicano in me, which means it's the fancy college degrees in me, which is also diverse of me. Everything in me is diverse, even when I eat American foods like hamburgers, which, to clarify, are American when a white person eats them and diverse when my family eats them. <laughs> so much of America can be understood like this. 
My parents were undocumented when they came to this country. And by undocumented, I mean sin papeles. And by sin papeles, I mean royally screwed. <laughs> Which should not be confused with the American dream, though the two are cousins. Colleges are not looking for undocumented diversity. My dad became a citizen, which should not be confused with keys to the house. We were safe from deportation, which should not be confused with walking the plank, though they're cousins. I call that sociology, but that's just a Chicano in me who should not be confused with the diversity in me or the Mexicano in me who is constantly fighting with the upwardly mobile in me, <laughs> who is good friends with the Mexican American in me, who the colleges love, but only on brochures, who the government calls non-white Hispanic or white Hispanic, <laughs> who my parents call mijo even when I don't come home so much. So tell us a little bit about that poem. How did, how did it come into being, and, and why did you pick that one to read? Um, I chose that poem because of the topic of our conversation. Um, and that's a poem that came into being. It was inspired by a poet named Idris Goodwin, who opened up his first book of poems with a similar kind of exploration of what it means to be black. And you know he kept trying to clarify, and he'd be like, not Sammy Sosa black, but also maybe Sammy Sosa black, you know what I mean? Like pre-2000 Sammy Sosa. And so he had all of these clarifications that instead of making it more clear or more simple to understand, <laughs> made it more difficult to understand. And when I wow. thought about all of the ways that, for me, identity changes, right? It's not a static thing. It led to me thinking about how I could, you know, try to write something with the intention of making it clear, but also at the same time, really bringing out some of the things that make it complex. Yeah, I, that's what I love about both of your works is that it's not, the, the ethnic categories, the racial categories are not, they're malleable, they, they shift, you know? And that's something we see, I'm from El Paso, La Frontera, Juarez and El Paso are right side by side each other. We cross back and forth. We find ways to cross even when we can't cross. Um, and, and it's just like, that's how our ethnic and racial eth uh, categories also are. You know, we, we're, we're constantly kind of navigating these, these different spaces. Um, in your introduction, you say that you started out wanting to write a book of love poems for the homies about friendship and in the middle of a pandemic. When was the moment you realized that it had to be about something more? And, and was it a moment again, or was it more like a gradual evolution? Yeah, I mean, I had... I started writing the second book of poems probably in 2019. And I wanted to write a book of love poems for the homies because it was at a period of time where a bunch of my friends were getting married. And that's really beautiful and exciting. But it also meant that we got to hang out less together, right? And so I wanted to write kind of a book of poems about all the ways that our friendships are so central to who, you know, to our growth as people and to our loves, and yet also something to your point that we don't get a chance to talk about much, right? Mm. Everything, if I think about Hollywood, is about romantic love. And so I wanted to kind of take a second and honor these relationships for what they are. Um, and then the pandemic happened, and so I'm trying to write these love poems, and they kept getting super sad. <laughs> it was like, uh, it was just so filled with grief. And I, at first I was like, well, maybe I can edit out the grief, right? And I think wow. what I learned was actually the two have to coexist, right? It's, it's part of being a person in the world is learning. It's part of what makes all the love that we experience so powerful is that we have an understanding that our lives are temporary, that, that grief is inevitable, that we will have to experience these things, right? And so for me, that was kind of what pulled the book together, was like not trying to make it simple and neat, but kind of embracing the ways that, that love can be lonely at times, or love can be sad at times. Beautiful. And the grief was really personal for you, right? I mean, you, your parents were, were sick with COVID as you were writing some of these yeah, so both of my parents still live right outside Chicago, and um, I live in uh, New York. And so 
for me, the beginning of the pandemic was just, I mean, as for, I'm assuming a bunch of us, was just filled with fear, right? Not knowing exactly what was going to happen. Um, and both of my parents got sick. And uh, in particular, my dad is hard-headed, you know, Mexican dads. I don't know if y'all can relate. Um, and so he refused to go to the hospital at first, even though he was sick. And it wasn't until he like nearly passed out in the shower and he allowed my brothers to drive him to the hospital that he went. And so I really, there were multiple times during those initial months where I didn't know if I would ever see my parents alive again, you know? Um, and it got me thinking also about, you know, my grandmother on my dad's side who passed away in 2016. A lot of our family wasn't able to go and see her, right? Because she died in Mexico. Um, and it wasn't possible for people who didn't have, who were undocumented to go back and, and be there for her funeral. And so, yeah, for me, all of those feelings were kind of constantly present. Can, can you speak a little bit about um, how you settled on the themes that you did, like uh, God, gold, God, and, and glory? You talk a little bit about how that's, so those were the things that the Spanish came as they were searching and pushing the border for, further and for, further north, right? What, but, but, can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, and you say um, you were trying to practice the undoing of colonial infrastructure to, practi to practice an undoing of colonial harm. What did you mean by that? Elaborate. Yeah. So a lot of the poems in the book, I think if I'm thinking thematically, kind of center thinking about class, thinking about Latinidad, and then thinking about love, and then, of course, the relationships between all of these things and the way that they play with each other, right? Um, for me, thinking about God, gold, and glory, I was trying to think about how I could kind of reclaim that from history. Like you said, those, that was the banner that the Spanish came to the quote-unquote new world looking for, right? Um, and it's something that I also see as still reverberating, like the, not just the search for money, but the, the love of money, this sort of hyper-capitalism, and especially if I'm thinking at the beginning of the pandemic when you had, you know, people being called, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing the language right now, but uh, it, was, it wasn't necessary. What was the term that they, essential, essential workers, right. right? Who were being treated as though they were disposable, right? Um, and so I wanted to kind of think about how I could use that tagline, but then, like I said, try to practice an undoing, right? So try to think critically about how do these things still echo in our life and how can we begin to think more critically of maybe what, what should we really value instead of just money? How can we practice being more loving to each other? How can we build a world through poetry and maybe beyond poetry that is communal in a way that, um, the world I was looking at when I was writing mm. the poems was not actively communal. Wow, wow. Yeah, what, and what about that ojalá, ojalá, ojalá? Where did that? <laughs> ojalá <laughs> is my favorite word in Spanish. Uh, <laughs> I have it tattooed. Um, wow. And it's, it's my favorite word in Spanish because it's one of those words that feels untranslatable. Um, the closest word in English that I can think of is hopefully, right? But hopefully doesn't have that sense of holiness that I feel when I say ojalá, or when my mom says ojalá, si Dios quiere, whatever it may be, right? And so for me, there's something powerful in kind of invoking that particular word. Um, and so that for me is why ojalá is so important to the book. Nice. And it's from Arabic, no, isn't and it? And it's yes. from Arabic, inshallah. absolutely, yes. yeah. It yes. comes from inshallah, yeah. Nice. Um, I also noticed there was a lot of imagery about worms and mouths and hunger, and you've kind of already spoken to this about how class informs your writing, but can you elaborate a little bit more on that and, and, and why, why the mouth specifically? Why that, why that imagery? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, so I grew up in Calumet City, Illinois. My dad is a steel worker. My mom um, is a custodian. And so, you know, my some of my earliest memories are like of friends getting Power Rangers toys and, you know, us, me and my brothers asking for Power Rangers toys and getting like the dollar store knockoffs. <laughs> uh, and, and so I just, I can't help it. I start, I, I kind of feel like 
I have a sickness of sorts. I went to France one time when I was uh, first dating the person who's now my wife, and she was like, wow, isn't this amazing? We're in France, everything is so lovely and beautiful. We're in the old country. And all I could think about was like, I'm from Calumet City. Like, <laughs> I, I shouldn't be here right now. I was like, wow. you know, I grew up, I grew up eating cheese, like powdered cheese out of a can. Like this is, it just, I can't help but imagine even when I'm in spaces of great wealth, the distance between, you know, where I grew up, where my parents grew up and where I'm at in any given moment. Yeah, wow. yeah, no, I think we all can relate to that experience for sure. Um, and then just the same question I asked Hector, um, when, did you hear the, when did you first hear the word Latino and what was the context and how did it make you feel? Yeah, so I grew up thinking of myself as Mexican-American, as Mexicano, as Chicano, and it wasn't until I went to college that I started to have a broader understanding of what Latinidad meant. And that was really powerful for me because my best friend in college was from Costa Rica. And he was like, <laughs> he was like, yo, thank God Mexican food is good because we don't get he was like, Central American people don't get nothing, bro. We don't get pupusas. We don't get, like, thank God tacos are good, because if they were bad, we'd really be hurting. Uh, so, so that was when, when I first started to understand not only the kind of communal ways, right, that, that we could relate to each other, but also the ways that within our community, there was this kind of you know, you talk about how invisible we are, but there are different levels of visibility, mm -hmm. right? I hadn't considered until that moment what it meant that I could go to Felipe's Burritos and get a burrito, but my buddy from Costa Rica didn't have like a similar restaurant he could go to, right? right. Um, and so for me, that was kind of the context that I started to think about myself as being Latino in addition to being Chicano or anything else. Um, so do you, I know as Latinos, we've been having this conversation nonstop to death <laughs> about Latino. Is it, is it still a useful label? Is, but I still want to ask you that question. Like, is it, is it too broad of a label? Is it, does it still have a, uh, a purpose in, in our conversations today? Well, I think it is the expression of, uh, of an alliance uh, between people of many different nationalities. And I think in that way, it's useful. I think it's, it's complicated in the way it relates to race. Because of course, Latin is a romance European idea. And Latino is a mixture of so many different kinds of peoples. You know, it's, our, our indigeneity is wiped out by that term, you know, Latino. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, it, and that's just, the, the term is just, I mean, our last names also wipe out our indigeneity. I mean, think about it. You know, you're, supposedly, if you do in the Southwest, DNA, the DNA of uh, average Latino person, there's like 40% indigenous. Well, that's, that should mean that we should have 40% indigenous last names, but we don't, right? It's more like half of 1% of people who have, you know, have indigenous last names. And that's because systematically that's been erased from our identity. So I think that it's, 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 um, it's a paradox. I think it's very necessary the fact that we're on the stage right now expressing shared experiences that many of us in this room all share an experience that is Latino, that's very important. But at the same time, all the history that's wiped out and simplified by the creation of a category, um, that to me is problematic. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, for me, I think it can still be useful because it allows us to kind of consolidate power in a way that we might not otherwise be able to, right? If I think about, you know, what the Mexican-American population is, it's whatever percent it is. But if you are able to find some common goals, if you are able to build relationships, then it, it gives us a chance to organize in a way that we can't organize individually. And so there is potential there. But like you said, absolutely, I, I understand why, why people would have issues with the term, right? I think it does, it can absolutely hide indigenous histories, Afro-Latinx histories. It can hide those experiences in a way that 
that is, you know, not only unfair, but unreasonable and, and something that we should absolutely, you know, remedy in some way. Yeah, I think as, as reporters, we were also having this, this conversation a lot, uh, whether, and, and I think in my, even my reporting, I try to be as specific as possible now, like even the, the country of origin is just, says just so much more about a person than just this, this label. Um, but at the same time, we need to talk about Latino voters and, and you know, um, la Latino poverty rates and Latino education rates. So it's, it's still kind of a helpful marker in that, in that way. Um, uh, let's see, are we forever destined as Latinos to write about migration? I, I ask this because we wrestle with it, this with, in, 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 within newsrooms as well. Uh, Latinos make up almost 20% of the U.S. population, soon, very soon in a couple of years to be 30%. Um, but I often have found myself trying to explain to editors that two-thirds of Latinos are actually born, raised, and racialized in the United States. And so I, we, we wrestle with it within, we wrestle with this question within newsroom. So just wanted to get your, your thoughts on that. <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that there, there's always, um, at the root of all of our stories, there's a story of empire, which is what I say in my book. You know, even if the border crossed you, if you're from New Mexico or Southern Texas, and really you never crossed a border for 400 years of your family history, the empire drew lines that basically separated you from your past. So uh, to me, that's so the migration and empire are always gonna be part of our story. My problem is that the way in which migration stories are told, they're told in a very one-dimensional way. We're victimized, right? We are perpetually victimized in American media migration stories. And as we all know, Right, that's not our full story. It's the, the way in which the migration story is told robs us of our volition, of our will. And so uh, to me, my whole career is an attempt to do two things at once, honor my immigrant heritage of my immigrant parents and my immigrant communities at the same time to show the world I am a thinker. I can write about anything. Yeah. I can write about Chilean miners. I can write about a white guy from Urbana, Illinois. My last novel, by the way, also on sale uh, here. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think that that is, uh, it's this thing that hangs over us, but it's also our cause. And so, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't believe we're perpetually fated to just write about that, but it's a big chunk of our experience. Yeah, I agree with that. Um... I remember taking a writing class when I was in college, and uh, I went to college at Harvard, and um, when I took my writing class, uh, I remember I was in New England, right? I was writing a poem about the trees, and I turned in this poem to my classmates about the trees in New England, and my classmates were like, wow, you know, this image of the leaves falling, it's like migration from, <laughs> it's like, it's such a beautiful story about how when you're a migrant person, you can't assimilate because your leaves will always change. And I was like, oh, these people can't read. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what I write. If I write a love poem, if I write about trees, if I write about concrete, all they're gonna see is migration, right? And so <laughs> part of it is not even necessarily about what we're, you know, fated to write or not. It's also, you know, the person on the other side can't understand us outside of migration, right? And so for me, that's the other part of it. Wow. Yeah, well yeah and you, you talk about this too, the, the in-betweenness. Even Latino is a, in uh, a label, not either here nor there, neither aquí, ni allá. But I see it as... I'm from both places, <laughs> because I'm from well, the border. You're from Juan yeah, yeah, El Paso, which yeah, is both I'm, places. Yeah, I'm Mexican and I'm American. Right. <laughs> um, uh, yes, and that was actually going to be my, one of my other questions, is you, you both write about uh, the effects of empire on nuestra gente, this, this tortured past, or this in, inherited loss that we carry from, from one generation to the next. But you also do a really good job of capturing people's joy. Like, I laughed so hard at some, some of your <laughs> poems just because I related so much to my own father, my own, uh, father and my mother and my Mexican parents. Um, so how do, you, how do you strike that balance between the, the, the hurt and, and the joy? For me, 
it's really essential because when I first started writing, I felt like the poems that I received the best feedback from were the sad poems. And so, you know, you get positive reinforcement. You want to keep writing those types of poems. And then when I took a step back, I was like, but this doesn't feel, it doesn't feel right with me. It doesn't feel truthful in the way that I want to be truthful. And it's because even though my parents were undocumented growing up, the other side of that is we were always, you know, going to parties. We were always, you know, having people over. I grew, my uncles and my cousins are like the funniest people I know. My mom was all, like, you talk about poetry, my mom was the first poet I knew. She was always gossiping to me about <laughs> the family next door and telling me about her novelas. You know what I mean? Like, it just, it was like, just because they don't necessarily, they being, you know, maybe white readers or, or outside readers can't understand us as full human beings, doesn't mean, it, it was important for me to remember that, like, we, you know, I don't come from a sad people. I come from a people that laugh, that dance, that party, that, you know, drink too much sometimes. So uh, <laughs> that, that was important to me to represent. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely. I think that as a writer, um, stereotypes are boring and they, they suck the energy out of you, you know? And it's like, to me, I'm always writing against type because life writes against type, you know? I tell them to my writing students, write against type, you know? And um, because that's what life is. My, my parents are intellectuals. My father got as far as the sixth grade in Guatemala, read like crazy. First thing he did when he came to the United States, did his night school equivalency for high school. And I meet people like him and like my mother all over the United States, you know, people who are really curious and who have these intellectual lives. And to me, that's what's most missing. And that's also the hardest thing about being a Latino writer mm -hmm. is that people don't see us intellectually, mm -hmm. you know? and they don't see us, they see us as these performers. And there's always that temptation to perform that kind of shtick, you know, of being a, a, a Latino writer and telling stories about my abuelita. My abuelita's great, you know, but I have more to say than just that, you know? And so, um, absolutely, I just wanna say I agree 100% with Jose. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting that you're, to, to hear this, if, uh, we're talking about the, the world of, of literature and books and movies, right? And, and, and but you see that a lot in, in politics as well. I, I feel like I saw that across the country, Latinos not feeling seen by either party. And I think that, that, that at the root of it is what, what you're talking about, is that this, 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 this dissatisfaction with, with both parties because they're not seen as like intellectual beings, you know? Like, Absolutely. Like voters that can make up their minds and decide. And that's why you're seeing such a rise in independent, like the, the, the largest, um, uh, demographic, the largest political demographic that's growing is this independent voter. Um, and, and when we talk about independent voters, we're often talking about Latino voters. So that's, it's, it's really fascinating to hear it from that perspective. And I think we're getting the 15 minute flags, but uh, the 15 minute marker, but um, wanted to, um, can you talk a little, a little bit about the American dream and how it plays into your, into your writing, whether it's, again, whether, it, I just think about the American dream a lot because it's, it's used in politics a lot. It's being used by Latino candidates on, on, from, on the Democratic side and on the Republican side to shut people in and to welcome people in. So I'm, I'm wondering how it, it kind of factors into your work. For me, the American dream was so important to me growing up in part because my parents would talk to me about El sacrificio that they made in coming to the United States and how they wanted me and my brothers to get educated, similar to you, like my parents, neither right. of them finished high school, neither of them even made it to, to the secondary in Mexico. Um, and so it was really important for them to, uh, for us to get a good education. And then uh, the year that I graduated from Harvard, which should be like the fulfillment of an American dream, was also at the same time uh, that my family was being evicted from our childhood home. Wow. And so it, having that happen simultaneously made it clear to me that there was no way 
you could do all the right things, right? You could save your money. You could purchase a house in the suburbs. You could try to fulfill everything that goes with the American dream. You could go to Harvard, to the Ivy League, whatever. And at the end of the day, the reality is that it's so imaginary. It's, it vanishes. It, 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 you can't actually Absolutely. ever get a piece of it, right? And so it made it clear to me that I wasn't ever going to out-educate my way into the American dream. There was no actually reaching that promised land. It was a myth. Wow. Uh, and so for me, that was when I was like, I can't write poems that try to glamorize this thing that is actually rotten at its core. Wow. wow. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think my, my chief problem as, a, as an adult now, uh, thinking about the American dream, father of three, owner of you know, a home, et cetera, is that the idea of the American dream attempts to erase class from the American equation. And class is a reality. Inequality is a reality. The structures that produce inequality, right, are, are a reality. And so we're led to believe that we can somehow triumph over this system that enslaves most of our people and many other peoples, you know? And to me, that is, yes, absolutely, it's a myth, it's toxic, you know? And, and it's sold to us as this thing that we're going to achieve success, that's gonna be this pill that makes us feel happy and we're gonna have a swimming pool and we're gonna have, you know, all these things that are gonna just erase 500 years or a millennia of history. And it just is, a, it's a myth, and it's a myth for so many reasons, in part because it's unsustainable. Mm -hmm. You know, this attempt to create this dream, not just for us, but for an entire country of 300 million people, has helped to destroy, almost destroy the planet. And so, um, to me, it's absolutely, I couldn't agree more that, that, I think that's part of our mission as artists, is to sell another version of of happiness, of work, of labor, of building community, one that's outside of this very shallow commercial idea of what a human being should be. I was actually going to ask, what would you replace it with? What would, what would be your version of that, which I think you kind of... Well, you know, I'm really ha I was really proud of ending my book with this idea of utopias mm -hmm. and how um, we need to just have... We just need to kind of act out the way we want to see the future. We need to dress up and do crazy things, you know? Uh, my, my, the last chapter of my book begins with, the, with drag and these, you know, these LGBTQ notions of, uh, of erasing ways of, of creating new ways of being. So to me, it's about the communal idea. And it's something that I would not say socialistic at all, no. I would say it's this idea of creating another way of being as a person. Uh, of being with our fellow human beings. And so to me, that's, that's the beginning. And I think that Latino people, because of our experience, we have something very important to contribute to that conversation about a new way of being an American. Perfect, I think that's a great way to open it up for questions. Thank you. Any, any questions? Oh. <laughs> Can start. <laughs> Hello. Um, so this is mostly for Hector, but I think Jose could answer this as well, being fellow from Chicago. Um, so in Hector's book, In Inventing Latinos by Laura Gomez, a big theme I really appreciated was how blackness and whiteness are seen as defining anchors to Latinidad. So I'm black and Mexican, and mm -hmm. I feel like being able to fit into Latinidad is a lot harder than it is to connect with fellow members of the black community. Wow. Particularly because race itself is you know, phenological and visual. So especially as we get to second, fourth gen kids like myself, how do you see Latinidad continue to warp around those two poles of blackness and whiteness? I think that the most important lesson I learned from writing this book is how important it is to learn each other's stories. So this book is as much a celebration of the gifts of African American history as it is about anything, right? To me, I tell the story of my African-American godfather, 
who showed up at the door to my mother's apartment and offered her in his broken Spanish, he was taking Spanish classes, offered her a ride to the hospital. Uh, and that's the beginning of my family's connection to black history. But really, all of us as Latino people, we have this incredible debt. So to me, I urge Latino, Latino people to study, um, to study these various, including the I construction of whiteness. How is white constructed? There's a, there's a big, uh, one of my chapters is about, uh, tells a story that weaves Asian and Guatemalan and American history together because they are woven together. Uh, we, we, if you're a Latino person born the child of immigrants, you owe your citizenship to a Chinese American uh, who filed a suit whose case went to the Supreme Court at the end of the 19th century, right? Wong Kim Ark. So to me, the most important thing I think we can do is to encourage this spirit of cross-cultural inquiry where we all study the, these, these stories and understand, most importantly, the way they're all braided together. Yeah, for me, I don't know that I could answer how, over time, Latinidad will continue to evolve around the poles of whiteness and blackness, but I can think about it within a specific context, right? And so for me, I think about Chicago a lot. And when I was five years old and Spanish was my only language and I was in an all English classroom, the people, the classmates that actually took the time to attempt to talk to me, though I couldn't speak English, were my black classmates. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't, and that kind of began to establish for me a sense of like what community could be like. You know what I mean? And it got me to think about what it means to be intimate with people in the ways that I was sometimes welcomed into rooms of black people where maybe, you know, to understand that that, that that intimacy is to be respected and cherished, right? And so I, I think there are possibilities in community for the way that Latin, I, I don't think it's set in stone how it will continue to change is what I'm attempting to say, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think we owe it to ourselves to continue to, to kind of preach against anti-blackness, to continue to, uh, to organize ourselves against that. Um, to organize ourselves with indigenous people so that we can try and create a future, the best possible future where Latinidad is not harmful, does not become more harmful than maybe it can already be at times. Can I say one more thing about that? I, I teach in California and I have a lot of students, you ask them, where are you from? And they say, I'm from South Central Los Angeles. And that's a way of saying, I grew up with Latino and black people together. And it's like, the idea of constructing ethnicity is always being constructed. So I see this kind of ethnogenesis taking place where there are people who are saying, look, we share in this part of, of LA or in this part of Atlanta, we share this common experience. This is also something that's important. That's part of, that's a story, a shared story that we maybe should think of as much as we think about being black or Latino, if that makes any sense. And you see that in, in Arizona as well. In in 2011, when you had these really hardline anti-immigrant legislation uh, uh, bills come through, uh, there was a movement of Latinos that, that organized to fight back against, against that legislation. Going back just recently in, 2000, in, in, in 2020, 2021, a lot of these groups have morphed into these more progressive kind of thinking more, uh, you know, centering black, black lives, centering um, LGBTQ. It, it's just a, a, a different space. It's kind of morphed. It's kind of evolved into more like, kind of what you're talking about. Right. Um, so it's, it's just it's interesting to see how the organizing is. is uh, <laughs> we got it, five minutes. Um, so um, you, you, before, before we get to the question, I just want to say that they're going to be signing at the end of this panel. So please head out and, and buy their books and, and have have more conversations afterward. Um, and go ahead, sorry. <laughs> um, many of us try to seek higher education to prove our intelligence, but in that process, we lose ourselves and we end up being isolated from everyone. I know for me, I come from a community that's only 2% Latino. Mm. So seeking higher education, we tend to lose ourselves, and I know I felt isolated from that. Where do you find joy when you go through, like, traveling to a new location where it's just only you? 
Well, I think that uh, you should try to turn your education against itself. Mm -hmm. I, when I went to college, I learned so much just by hanging out in the library and just reading about Latin American history, which I, you know, I had never been taught before. So I think that even that space that feels segregated, that feels isolated, there are things that you can study in that space that you can use to give a sense of wholeness to yourself. Yeah, for me, I, even, even when I've traveled through places that are predominantly white, I'm always, there's always like a little tiendita, you know what I mean? Right. It, there, there is no corner of this country that I've ever been where there haven't been Latinx people running something, right? <laughs> Right. Whether, you know what I mean? And so for me, it wasn't, it's not always the students that hold the, you know what I mean? Like people, you know, maybe there's not, you know, grad students that I can relate to in that particular way, but there are always some kind of worker that I can come to. And honestly, for me, that was like one of the ways that I got through Harvard was like, the guys that worked in my building would check on me and they'd be like, mijo, you don't look too good. Like, what's, wow. what's going on with you? Wow. And like, for real, they would check up on me because I really was also having a very difficult time and was feeling very alienated there. And it was them who could see that and who took the time to really reach out to me. So it may not always be, you know, the people who you're supposed to be on equal terms with intellectually or in terms of class, but like, for real, like, we're not very hard to find, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, so, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask, is there a way of looking at race that is not grounded in what I feel is sort of this idea of white exclusion, like basically white people determine what races are, like, mm -hmm. I'm Cuban, all of us could pass for white, but we're not because white people say we're not. Just like Jewish people are not white because white people decided that their religion and their history is too different from whiteness. And so as we're looking at race, is there some way of viewing it that is separate from this idea of whiteness as the default that determines what is white and what is everything else? If there is, what would that look like? And if there's not, then what does it actually say about race generally? Well, you've hit the nail on the head of exactly what race is, because race is a story. There is absolutely no biological basis to the idea of race. You look at any dictionary, that's the first thing it says. So race is a story that was invented to justify inequality, to justify why there were black people that were being, that were being enslaved, right? And so to me, that's at the very heart of what, um, of what race is. So to me, white, the race terms and race ideas are useful only to the extent that we can tear them apart to see who we really are and to see the way those stories have led to the creation of myths of ourselves. You have been racialized as a Cuban person not because of anything that's inherently, you know, racial about being Cuban, but because race does that. That's what race does. It creates stories about people. So when you left Cuba, your family lives Cuba and comes to here, you are now part of this American story. And race is an idea that explains how you fit in the story of the United States. Perfect. And with that, our time is up. I'm sorry. <laughs> but thank you no, so much perfect. for, and it's an honor to be with you guys. Thank you.